But I'm going to let John take the stage here for our uh, free agent profile. You and I'll, I'll put this up, the the profile you put up on, on A to Z Sports um, about this particular player. And an interesting one based on the coaching situation we just talked about. So it fits in nicely for a couple of different reasons. And a guy that, again, you would take from a team that you are competing hard against and your gain would be their loss. Well, I mean, there's the intro right there. The last time the Bengals were a last place team in the AFC North was 2020. Entering the 2021 offseason, how do they get the edge back in the area that they needed the most, right? How do they solidify a weakness back into a strength while also hurting a team that they wouldn't mind hurting? I think Geno Stone, the safety from the Ravens, makes perfect sense here. And honestly, would rem- would be reminiscent of the Bengals taking Mike Hilton from the Pittsburgh Steelers in a lot of ways, in a lot of similar ways. Um, I could I could give you like PFF stats. I could tell you that he graded out at 85.3 in coverage this year. I could tell you that he led the NFL in interceptions with seven, even more than Jesse Bates. I could tell you all that stuff, but I think with Gino, with Geno Stone and going from the Ravens to the Bengals, you have to you have to continue to look at the factors and the attributes that the Bengals would look at in order to sign a guy to a multi-year deal. Is he young? Is he ascending? Is he looking for a second contract? And by ascending, I mean, is he about to start playing his best football or did he just start playing his best football? Therefore, you're getting the most value out of him. And does he have experience in the biggest games? Does he have experience playing on bright on against really good teams and for really good teams and deep into the postseason? Do you know Stone is not even 25 years old? He's going to turn 25 in April. This is his fourth year this past season with the Ravens, and it was the first time he played over 1,000 snaps. He vlogged, I think, exactly 1,000 snaps within the Ravens' defense, primarily because he had some injuries, I, th- I believe, to Marcus Williams there at safety, which is why I think he led the Ravens in snaps played for safeties. But he had like 1,000 snaps going into this season, then he had 1,000 this year, and the Ravens' defense was better for it. They just had him back there at free safety, either patrolling the middle of the field or maybe some of those half coverages. And again, we can go into the data, we can go into all that stuff, but Anthony, there's a video in this article that I would love uh, for you to play for the audience. I believe it's like a little bit down towards the end, and it features a nice breakdown of a play that, again, when the Bengals are going through these these pro scouting um, profiles, they're going to try to find anything that they can in terms of like, okay, how is this guy going to fit in? Is there an example of anything? I think it's a little bit f- further up, maybe. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if the tweet loaded on your screen. I can share my screen if, if that would help. So let's, oh, let's have Ben Solak take it away here. Little play. Bengals, Ravens. Three receiver set for the Bengals in the high red zone. Corner route from Tyler Boyd. Under from Trent Irwin. All this is to open T. Higgins. Number two receiver. Runs an in-breaking route, but it's a trick. And he goes vertical. This is a beater. It's a rule breaker designed to screw with the Ravens. The Bengals know when the Ravens get a three receiver set, they want to play match coverage, right? Four defenders up here with a certain set of rules and the bottom two receivers, three cover defenders, you run a different set of rules, right? Match coverage. The rule they're attacking is Roquan Smith. If there's a in-breaking route from this number three receiver, Roquan's got it. But if there's a, a vertical route from this number three receiver, Roquan can give him away to Kyle Hamilton if that number two receiver runs the in-breaking route, hand that number three receiver off, fall off, and now defend that in-breaking route from number two. So the Bengals say, hey, watch this. Tyler Boyd's going vertical. Oh, T. Higgins, in-breaking route. And now Roquan's, he's there. He's ready for that throw. And T. Higgins climbs upfield. Roquan's never getting back on his horse and getting to this ball. This is a touchdown every day of the week, if not for Geno Stone. The weak side safety coming from the back side. How did he get there? Here's Geno Stone's rules. This isolated receiver, three, three over here, one down here, he's usually really good. This is Jamar Chase. And so if he runs an inside release, then Geno Stone can double him with this corner, right? Any in-breaking route, slant, curl, you're on the dig, you're on the post, Geno's going to be there to help out. But if it's an outside release, that corner has the sideline to help him out. And so now Geno can ignore Jamar Chase, leave him in single coverage, and poach. He can go poach the middle of the field. And if there's any routes working that middle of the field, he can go be a defender to them. Now, this is not... An outside release. Jamar Chase runs inside. And it's funny because Geno Stone got asked about the interception after the game. Outside release, you know, and then uh, after that, I just went back, I just went back to the middle. I seen Joe said he ran an outside release, which did not happen. But it's fine because it's still a really, really, really good play. It's a good play because he's watching Joe Burrow's eyes. 
And Joe Burrow barely glances to that, that weak side before setting to the front side. So you know he's not throwing the slant. He'd have to look at it. And if he's throwing the dig or the post, you're still going to be there for it, right? And so he's just going to let Burrow's eyes take him the middle of the field. This is where the action is. And I know that I've still got single coverage down here, so I'm okay to freelance this a little bit. And then Burrow uncorks that thing right into Stone's waiting arms. Wonderful play. Don't really have anything more to add on to that. I think with, with Gino. It, it's not it's not only just the fact that he's been developing within the Ravens system for a while and finally got his chance to really shine. I, I think the Bengals have been a, a firsthand witness to see some of that development. And what better way to improve your secondary by also making the Ravens secondary worse? Now, the factors also come into play here with the Ravens losing their defensive coordinator and losing their secondary coach. There's turnover, obviously, on that side of the ball. You have to pay, you have to consider the fact that Marcus Williams is already getting paid a lot. Kyle Hamilton is your is their first round pick from a couple years ago. He's due for a paycheck in about a year's time, and you're still wanting to obviously play those guys as much as possible. Geno Stone was great in that rotation, but the fact that the Ravens don't have a lot of cap room, I think they're like at seven million right now in space. Mm -hmm. The fact that they already have investment in there, I think it leads to and and again like a new coach coming in. I think it leads to a guy like Geno Stone looking for opportunities elsewhere, which actually ends up being having him available here. And our guys at A to Z, Josh and uh, um, Quinn, who you know do all, all of our projections of our contract projections, they have him at about eight and a half million a year for over three years, and that's pretty much when you count for like cap inflation because the cap was like 182 million when Mike Hilton signed. Now it's like going to be 240 million. I think factoring in inflation is basically the same deal in terms of average money per year or average annual value. It, it, it just feels like the exact same type of deal that the Bengals got from Mike Hilton to basically fill a very similar role and to, and to steal away from a rival. It just makes it makes almost too much sense for this to not happen, honestly. So explain a little bit how you see him fitting in because he, you know, he's kind of like you mentioned in a rotation with the Ravens right now, right? He's kind of doing a couple of different things with them. How would you see him? in the Bengals system fitting in what, what strengths and, you know, scheme, what, what do you, what do you see from him? I mean, obviously that was a great breakdown from, from Ben Solak there uh, about the play, but how else would you see him fitting? I mean, you've got, you know, you've got Nick Scott, you've got Mike Hill and I, you know, there's all these players on the, on the defense where you go, okay, let's get Geno Stone. What do we do with him once he's here? Right. So the Bengals need more than anything, someone they can trust, to patrol deep zones at safety because right now it's not Dax Hill and it wasn't really Jordan's battles strength coming out of college anyways they really needed Nick Scott to do that it's the whole reason why they brought him in so they can allow Dax to you know kind of stay close to the line of scrimmage and maybe ease him into more of those deep responsibilities as soon as Nick Scott just proved to be a liability they had to force Dax back there probably before he was ready they were doing too much with him they were moving him around too much and that's why I think he had as inconsistent of a year as he did I don't think that Luna Inaruma wants to enter this year with a lot of pressure to get that unit right without someone that is capable and is proven in that role as a deep safety, whether either you're a post safety or you're just responsible for just half half the field, which I think Dax can still do on a certain basis. And I think Jordan Battle can do as well. So I know there's going to be some conflict in terms of like, oh, if, you, if you're having three safeties, you know, like one of them is not going to be on the field or one of them is going to lack development time and everything like that. And if the worst thing that happens is either Dax or Battle play like 100 or 200 fewer snaps than they would without a guy like Geno Stone in there, I think that's the price you pay for just how disastrous last year was and the fact that you can't enter 2023 with the same questions or the same just banking on hope for the sake of banking on hope. I think Geno Stone would come in and he would solidify that need of a guy, okay, this this is the explosive play um, eraser, essentially, to make sure that everything is covered up in the back end, keep everything in front of you. There, There is, I guess, the risk of last year being the fact that there was this first you know, full year as a starter, and yeah. it was such a really yeah. high high. You don't know if that's sustainable and everything. It's kind of similar to Trey Hendricks in that regard. Like Trey didn't really break out until his fourth year with, with the Saints. He had 13 and a half sacks. There's a lot of criticism about you know banking on him. You know, being that same guy or even better, and obviously that worked out for the Bengals. But I think it's a, it's a lot of similar factors here. You know, Stone was a seventh round pick who just bided his time within a really good defense, and once he got his time to shine after a few years of development, he's the player that he is now, and he's not the guy that's going to necessarily break the bank. So I think it makes sense financially as well. I, I love it. I mean, I, I love it, and I don't think that he would be a you know an absolute you know game breaking type of player. But if you can recreate at 
the same, if not very close to the level of what we saw in 21 and, and to a little bit to a lesser extent in 22 uh, in the, in the fact that what Bates and Bell gave you. And then of course you had Trey flowers in there as kind of a niche player. You had Mike Hilton and you can kind of mix and match. Now you've got Dax, you've got, I would assume a Geno stone and correct me if I'm wrong, you know, maybe to make room for that or to make that make sense. Maybe that means Nick Nick Scott is is gone at this point. 100%. You know, we, we, yeah. So um, you know, but if you're able to kind of recreate some semblance of that defensive formula in the secondary with those players, you get further development from Battle. You get further development from Dax Hill. Maybe you slide Dax Hill into a different role if you bring in Geno Stone. That sort of thing. I, I like I like the idea of it, and it's not. Especially, I mean, yeah, it sounds kind of like a, a lot at eight million for a guy that got his first real shot last year. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I, I think, I think that this is a pretty solid move if the Bengals were to make it. And, and the last thing I want to cover because I know that the Dax Hill situation or dilemma is definitely going to be a talking point this off season, just about what they're going to do. Like Duke Tobin was already asked about him, and I think the answer that Duke gave was confident in his ability but there's questions or at least there's uncertainty about what the plan is going forward and the fact that there needs to be a concrete plan for just how to implement him i think with dax if they're committed to him being the free safety and just having that role that he tried and failed last year i think he can eventually get better and he can be okay but if they commit him to being more in the box and potentially even taking over from mike hilton as a slot defender he can be more than okay because right now dax is pretty good close to the line of scrimmage he's not so good the further you move him away yeah and if they continue yeah. to develop him i think he can get he can get better as a deep safety at the, at the geno stone role if you will but i think if you continue to develop him where he's already pretty good he can become potentially great and i think that's the best way to maximize him and utilize him going forward again if nick scott had been better and they were doing as much in terms of moving Dax around. I think his 2023 would have been better, and maybe we would be feeling a lot better about where he's going forward in terms of just replacing Jesse Bates. But that didn't happen, and now they're in the bed that they made because they didn't pay both Bates and Bell, and they tried to get cheap with Nick Scott, and it failed miserably. So I think this is the best way to salvage that without also without giving up on Dax Hill entirely. Like again, like Dax is, I think he's a fine player. I think he he should continue to be featured within the defense, but there has to be a realization about what he does best and where he can develop the best and i think the best version of him is playing closer to the ball well i think we all have confidence in luana rumo that he'll figure out that formula after a season's worth of tinkering with things and like we said there are some some positives at the end of the year in terms of jordan battle uh proving that he's the part and and other elements